And um, then, yeah, so I don't know if you thought about the, the, the final function at the end. Um, I think we talked about that a little bit, but, um, but you will have to reuse um, your uh, function when you implement the is safe. Um, so in that case, uh, yeah, you do have to initialize some things, but um, um, you know, you're basically going to be using the find candidate process and then the re release allocated resources. So you're going to be looping um, as long as find candidate process returns something that's not the no candidate, the, the flag to indicate that there's no more candidates left. Um, and then each time you find a candidate, you're going to have to call the, the release allocated resources on that candidate to simulate returning their resources back. And you'll need to, to mark the uh, process as being completed in that array of Booleans. Uh, it'll, it'll go from being false to being true for the completed array. So, um, but yeah, if you do that, oh yeah, and like I said, kind of for, for us, for this simulation, after you do that, so after you have your while loop for the is safe, at the end, uh, you'll have to have like another loop, most likely. So you have to test and see uh, if, if, if any of the processes aren't completed yet. So, so you need to check all that array of completed processes. And, and if you find one that's still not completed, then you should be returning false um, from the is safe. But all, and but uh, if if all of them are completed, then that's an indication that the, the state was safe. So you found. Um, a sequence of the, the process running and, and returning their resources um, that allowed all of them to run to the, the state is safe in that case. Right. So, so for us, you know, that means that the final, the, the final thing to determine whether to return true or false, you have, you have to also have another loop there looking through all of the, um, what we're calling the completed array. Um, all right. Um, I thought I might maybe talk a little bit about some stuff here. I'll record this and post this also. Uh, if anybody watches this after the fact. Um, but um, yeah, th this is beginning to think about the review for uh, this unit for um, next week. So um, I just wanted to mention because I talked a little bit last time about the deadlock prevention and the deadlock avoidance. We've been in, you know, for, for our two assignments, we've been mostly uh, concentrating on the banker's algorithm, which is a deadlock avoidance mechanism. Um, but, you know, I wanted to make certain that people don't um, kind of forget about the other two. Um, so, I mean, so I'll just say, I mean, there are going to be questions on the test, um, about deadlock prevention and about deadlock detection. All right. So in particular, you should understand that for deadlock prevention, um, that is addressing one of those necessary and sufficient conditions for the um, existence of a deadlock, right? So if you can remove one of those four conditions, you can totally prevent deadlocks from ever happening, right? We talked about that a little bit. Um, in the previous session. And I think I talked about that in the lecture videos this week as well. So um, you can't really you can't really do anything about the first one. You know, you can't really remove the need for mutual exclusion mechanisms or else your system won't um, be um, correct. You'll get uh, incorrect results if you don't enforce mutual exclusion. But you can do things about the other three that we talked about a little bit. Um, but yeah, I thought, I thought I would also kind of start talking a little bit about the deadlock detection as well. Um, I mean, this is different. So, so the algorithm, if, if, if you guys look through this, has some similarity to the banker's algorithm, but, but we're doing something completely different here, okay? So for deadlock detection, you don't prevent or you don't keep deadlocks from happening. Uh, deadlock detection is just about, okay, 
if this is the current state of the system, is there a deadlock or not, right? So the, the main difference from this and the banker's algorithm is we don't have a claim matrix anymore. So, so we're not trying to see if a state is safe or not, uh, safe or unsafe. Um, we're simply given a state of the system and we have to we have to determine is there currently a deadlock or not in the system, all right? So, so the answer for deadlock detection, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'll say this. I'll probably say this again next week when we're kind of reviewing for the test three. So, so if I ask you to do banker's algorithm and you're telling me that there's a deadlock uh, or not a deadlock, you know, you're doing something wrong, or vice versa. You know, if if, if on the test I say here's the current state, QA, and you tell me the state is safe. When I ask you to do deadlock detection, you, you've done something fundamentally wrong. You know, you're, you're not understanding. What, what I'm asking for, for deadlock detection is, given the state, is there a deadlock or, or not in the system? You know? So a common thing that, uh, that people are able to do is you know, how do we draw one of those resource um, um, allocation graphs um, that was uh, um, talked about at the first part here. Um, uh, one of these, basically, because basically, if you can draw a graph like this, if the, if the system is simple enough, um, then you that you can visually detect if there's a deadlock or not by finding a um, circular, um, um, you know, a, a, a path, a circular path in the directed graph um, that um, um, exists. That's that's the fourth condition that there's a, a circular set of weights here, right? And then in the path, I, I talked a little bit. You know, it does have to have uh, a circular path, but it also has to be that all of the resources are currently held or currently allocated on that path. So, so this one over here is is a circular weight. So there actually is a deadlock, but this one there's not a deadlock because there's actually a resource B available. Um, and and two resource A is available, right? So so these both of these requests could be um, granted right now from the available resources. Um, but you know we can do we can draw that same thing um, for like if you're given this information. So again, the information you're given for a deadline detection is slightly different. We don't have the maximum claim. We've just got the current state of the system. So. Um, you know, we should, for example, you know, we do have total resources, that's kind of the same, and we have like an available vector B, right? Um, and we should have the, the same relationship like we talked about for bankers algorithm. So if you look at the allocations um, and the total resources, that they should have a relationship with what's currently available, right? So if we've got two, uh, among the four processes here, we've got two of resource one allocated, We've got two total of resource one systems, so there's zero available. So that, that's the same as what we had before. Right? But instead of a claim matrix, maximum claim, um, um, we have what is currently allocated and the, the current outstanding request. So, so these are the processes have gone to a point where they were requesting a resource and they blocked or they're, they're waiting to be granted that resource or not. All right? So, so we can draw like a graph of this. So this one might be a little bit complicated. So I've got five resources. Uh, but you know, I've got two of resource one. Um, and, and one one of resource two, one of resource three, two of resource four, and one of resource five. Um, so that's the basic representation of resources in the uh, resource allocation graph. Um, and then we can use the allocations and the requests to draw the processes. Right? So we've um, got four properties. So like process one here um, currently is allocated. If you, um, you have to look at the row to get this here. So process one currently is allocated one each of one, three, and four, 
right? So we put that. So, so an allocation is shown as a arrow from a resource to the process. So one of resource one, that B resource three, resource four. The process two has got a resource one and resource two. Uh, the last one, resource one, two, three. And so, yeah, I'm just doing the allocations first here. So, process three just has a resource one and resource four. Uh, and um, four then. Um, and then the requests are the current outstanding requests in the system. So those again are, are the the process has done a request to lock, but but the system hasn't granted the lock yet. So it's waiting to obtain the lock. So process one has an outstanding. So, so we, we we draw arrows from the process to the request to the resources requesting for a request. Requesting to requesting a um, five. Two has two outstanding requests for three. Five. Three has just one request for five. And request four is request number one. Request four is request number one. It was a bit messy. We'll have to see, but um, uh, there is a deadlock in here. So it's so again. Um, the resource block uh, hasn't been allocated, so, so it can't be part of the debt block, right? So only, only when all the resources are committed is there going to be the debt block. So if I remember right, I'm sure that the text block talks about it, but um, I think it's uh, so I can look at box one and two and see if one something goes to resource two. Two resources, three resources, three at least one deadline. Two processes with two resources, one of each resource. One is holding one of them, is requesting the other, plus two. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's good to understand kind of this, this is what those resource allocation graphs were really showing. They're showing the current state of a system, um, the outstanding locks and requests, so the outstanding allocations, um, and uh, or well, the current allocations and then the outstanding requests to, to lock new resources. Um, Yeah, I mean, you know, like the banker's algorithm, I didn't, I didn't have to practice to Denmark, but that people ought to be able to do that too, but that's to do it. Um, so the, the, what the first step is, is um, mark each process that has a row in the allocation matrix of all zeros, okay, so it's a one. Mark for the allocations are all zeros, right? So in this case, I'm gonna have to draw the allocations here, but uh, we we do have process four is marked uh, by that step one here. So here, marking or unmarking process is like running process to completion. Mark. Four um, 
is. So basically, the reason why you can mark something that doesn't have anything allocated is it can't be part of a deadlock uh, because you have to have some things allocated and, and requesting some other things. So, um, I mean, an alternative version of this algorithm is we could also have looked at, at, at outstanding requests. So if you have outstanding requests are all zero, you also can't really be part of a deadlock. Uh, well, um, if, if you're not requesting anything, um, you're not um, going to be deadlocked yourself, but if you're holding some other resource, you might be temporarily causing a deadlock for others, other processes until you re release that resource. Uh, so anyway, so so yeah, but definitely if if you don't have anything allocated, you can't be uh, participating or, or in one of those circular weight conditions as part of the deadlock here. Um, so then the second step um, is, is we initialize W to be equal to B. So this is again, pretty similar to what we did before. So W is gonna be like the, the current available. And we're also going to be, when we have a process, we're gonna be uh, returning its resources back to W here. So what we're doing in this case is we're simulating letting a process run and releasing its resources so that we can see if, if after it re releases its resources, um, uh, uh, we don't have a deadlock anymore because now that resource is available. Um, so other processes could use it, even though there, it might look like there's a deadlock when, when that resource wasn't available. So the so W should be equal, start off to be equal to the V. Yeah, in this case, we only have. One of resource five here. Uh, and then, um, and then three and four is, is basically the loop. This is similar to what we did for bankers algorithm, you know, um, because basically we have to find a process. Um, um, you know, we're not checking needs, but we're finding a process that's, that's currently unmarked. So, so um, one that hasn't been marked yet is not being part of the deadlock. Um, and that's whose who's, who's queue, whose um, um, requests are um, less than or equal to W, basically whose requests could be um, um, granted. Um, if we if so, if we allow that process to run, allow it to um, all of its outstanding requests to be made, so they can get them, run to completion, and then release all of its locked resources. Right, that's kind of what we're doing on this step here. Right. So, um, so given that our current available, we've just got one of resource five. Um, 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 We look at Q here, um, and basically, initially, we're comparing it to uh, the, the V, which we copy to what the, the algorithm called W here. But, but yeah, so, so W right now is the same as the initial available. Um, yeah, basically, you can see, I mean, all these processes have requests for a two or a three or a one. We don't have any of those available. The only thing we have available is a five, right? Um, so the only process is the candidate's process three. Um, probably should have left that graph up because we could have seen what was happening here. But uh, process three was one of the, the, the processes that was, um, no, it wasn't one of the, the processes that was in the deadline. So process one and two are, are in the deadline, three and four. Um, so anyway, by this algorithm, we would, um, uh, we, we found, um, a process. So if we found that process, we're going to mark it and we're going to go ahead and add its corresponding allocations back to W. So again, pretty similar to the banker's algorithm at this step. So, so we would mark process three, uh, not part of the deadlock here. Uh, we would add its allocations. Um, so, so we're adding the allocations. You know, we're, uh, uh, this is simulating the process three is done, finished. So, so now it can unlock anything that it had allocated. So it's going to return back its resource four here. Um, so we end up with so one now, which is a 
now we've got the, the, the resource five and the resource four. If the trust three were to release what it had. But, um, um, and then you keep doing that. So basically, if you end up with all the processes marked, there's not a deadlock. But um, um, if you get to step three and you can't find um, a, a candidate, you can't find a process that's currently unmarked and whose um, current uh, requested um, you know, requests can be met from our current available, then, then you, you're done. Um, and, and you check whether everything was marked or not. So at this point, um, you know, if, if we look at our W, we have 00011, um, and then we look at our Q. So we've only got process one and two unmarked. So the process one, um, we can't meet its request because it wants a two. So again, I, I pointed that out before. It's basically process one and two are deadlocked on resource two and three. Um, but, um, but yeah, we've only got a resource four and a five right now. The process, process one and two are the ones that are unmarked. Process one was a resource two. We don't have any of those that we can we can use to give him. Process two needs a resource three. We also don't have any of those. Man. So basically, um, we couldn't find such a process or we couldn't find anything um, to terminate the algorithm. And at this point, since process one and two are unmarked, that means that the deadlock detection algorithm detected, there's a deadlock. And, and in particular, any process that's unmarked is, is in the deadlock, is, is an active member of the deadlock. So it currently can't proceed uh, because there's a circular weight um, in the system. All right. Um, So uh, yeah, so but um, I just want to emphasize that I'll probably you know talk some more about this next week as well um, when we kind of review these materials. Um, probably go over this again, but but everybody should be aware that that you know these are different things. Especially, I always get people um, are fuzzy about the difference between avoidance and detection, but but they really are distinct things, and you ought to under, understand what you're doing here, right? Um, um, Another thing I, you know, I talk about in my videos is that, that uh, I mean, for, for various reasons. So for example, the, the main reason that deadlock avoidance isn't commonly used in operating systems is um, the, 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 the need to upfront specify what your maximum needs are, um, uh, um, your maximum claims are, is not always realistic. Um, so, so you often don't really know or don't want to specify that. Um, that um, 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 something that um, I mean, either either you have to um, specify for the kind of the worst case. So 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 maybe normally when you run, you don't need nearly as much as you would need of a particular resource. Except sometimes, in the very worst case, you need a lot of that, um, right? So, so so either you have to kind of figure out what the worst case is. And specify that, um, or um, um, or yeah, I mean, there's kind of other constraints, right? So so that it makes it that that um, this, this kind of constraint that um, um, is, is is very tough in a real system to, to do, right? So that's that's why the deadlock like avoidance like bankers algorithm isn't commonly used and in most like operating general purpose operating system or so. So, I mean, it is common just to uh, allow deadlock to happen. And so the operating system might um, do a deadlock detect um, and then do something about um, processes that end up in a deadlock somehow. Um, so, um, and somewhat, um, You know, so so it might might sound a bit strange, but but a, a common thing if you're doing that, if you're just using deadlock detection, um, and then doing something after the fact when a deadlock 
uh, forms in the system is to just abort uh, all the deadlock processes, right? So to just just terminate them, um, right? So slightly slightly better approach is to try and uh, abort them one at a time. So so try and stop one process and see if that clears the deadlock. Um, right. But yeah, these other mechanisms for, for dealing with a deadlock after the fact really are, are getting at um, some of those necessary and sufficient conditions. So, I mean, you know, again, it's for many systems, there's no good way to be able to preempt a resource because if a process already has a resource, it means it might have done some work with that resource and you can't tell it to release that resource until it's finished its work, at least not safely, or or unless you build in some sort of a rollback mechanism, right? So, so things like, like four and two um, um, are, are really kind of roll, rolling back or, or dealing with one of those necessary conditions. And again, those things you have to build into the system beforehand in order to be able to do those, um, um, which often is not a realistic um, thing, you know, so it takes a lot more, um, uh, you know, it takes, takes a lot more resources uh, and, and it, it, it has implications for performance. If you try and add these into the system, you know, rollback mechanisms or things like that. Um, um, Uh, 